my name is Eric Cotter. I'm the Dean of Students. And it's a real pleasure to uh, momentarily introduce uh, our guest speaker tonight, Michael Schamberg. Earlier tonight before the movie, I think uh, as a real testament to the body of work Michael Schamberg's created in his 40, uh, 40 plus years as a producer, I asked you guys to say some of your favorite films besides this one. Let's do it again. Some of your favorite Michael Schamberg films besides this one. Pulp Fiction, Pulp Fiction Gattaca, Gattaca. Matilda. Matilda, Aaron Brockovich, Django Unchained, Garden State. I heard Big Chill. Actually, I said Big Chill. <laughs> Fish Call Wanda. I heard that too. I, someone in the back, I think. It is such an amazing long list. And I think what's so great about it is that the movies are not just great, they're cool. Think about it. Think about uh, Get Shorty. John Travolta, to me, who is still the picture of cool every day, maybe never more cool than he was as, uh, as a chili in Get Shorty. Think about Pulp Fiction, which managed to take three short films, a whole lot of real violent stuff, and put it into a blender and make an Oscar-nominated film that changed the whole independent film world. You got a corpse in a car, minus a head in the garage. Take me to it. His entire career has been marked by these movies, these films that weren't just great, but were something special, something memorable. And when we were discussing with him what movie to screen, of course, as you could see by all the screaming and the yelling earlier, it's hard to pick just one. But I'm thrilled they picked Out of Sight. You want to sit down and have cocktails with a woman who tried to shoot you? It was an unusual experience. Wow, you are mean. Because I don't even know what I love most about it. it could be the editing by Ann Coates, who also did Lawrence of Arabia with its you know, jumping and nonlinear style. It could be the performances, George Clooney, Jennifer Lopez, the supporting cast, Michael Keaton, the late great Dennis Farina. You know, who, and we have actors who always are beautiful on screen who've never looked sexier than they have in this film. It could be the music. It could be the directing, the wonderful Steven Soderbergh. Or it could just be the whole thing. It's a gigantic film, a big budget film, but it feels like one of the best independent films of the past 30 years. And I'm glad you all got to see it, those who hadn't seen it before. Part of going to film school is to see movies like this, is to capture the essence of these stories and your own stories. And of course, to meet the people behind them. So ladies and gentlemen, a real pleasure. Presented by uh, Tova Leiter, our producer here, Michael Schamberg. movie has not lost any of his charm. It really has not. And I remember the time when it was shown first. It's like it kind of brought Jennifer Lopez into a whole other area. Suddenly she was cool, you know, before it was like a little, you know. And George, was that his first movie? What was... No, the, the reason I picked this movie is there are a lot of threads in it that illuminate different aspects of how a movie is made and what a movie can do. And um, it, 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 the, the story behind it has a very long tale. I used to be partnered with Danny DeVito and Stacey Scher. And um, one day Danny got a phone call from Barry Sonnenfeld, the director, and said, um, hey, you should check out this book by Elmer Leonard, Get Shorty. So we got the rights to it, and um, Danny called Barry and said, well, we bought the book. And Barry said, what did you think? Danny said, no, no, we bought the book. We own the book. <laughs> and um, Stacy was very good friends with Scott Frank, who wrote that screenplay. And because that movie had been successful, we were in line to get Elmer Leonard's next book, which was, in fact, out of sight. And the way it came together is really interesting. Barry, who's an executive producer, and I think felt maybe the material's a little too adult for him. And we had a great screenplay by Scott Frank, who in fact was nominated for an Academy Award for his screenplay. And here's how it came together. Uh, Clooney had done um, three movies. He'd done Batman, which was a flop. He'd done One Fine Day, which was a romantic comedy that was a flop. And he'd done a kind of a cheesy action film called The Peacemaker, which also wasn't successful. George is really smart, and he knew that one more movie like that and his window to become a movie star, movie actor, was going to close. So... Um, he he was he owed Casey Silver a favor. He read the script at Casey, who was running Universal, and said, "I'll do it. I'll only do it 
if I get a good actor's director. So we then went around and met various directors. And, um, and, and Soderbergh, interestingly, who had won the Palme d'Or when he was in early 20s with Sex, Lies, and Videotape, had sort of reached the nadir of his career with a movie called The Underneath. And, but we knew Stephen could direct actors. So that's how we sort of put the two of them together. And it became an inflection point for both their careers, the inflection point being you can go up or you can go down. And it really literally changed both of their careers. I, I can only take credit for being part of a team that gave them the opportunity. I can't really take credit for their talent, which they always had. But that movie really changed both of their careers. And um, in, in putting it together, um, and Soderbergh said later, he said, I woke up every morning thinking if this movie was a flop, I, I'd never work again. But we we just treated him like he was at the top of his game, which he was. And I think Stephen feels he once referred to it as his least flawed movie. And it was very important that there be some real authenticity in the casting of, of uh, Karen Sisko, the, the girl. And um, and we went through every actress, Cameron Diaz, Courtney Love read for us. The studio had George and Stephen fly to Austin to meet Sandy Bullock because she was, was and still is a big star. But Lopez just gave the best reading, and, and the, the studio supported it. So the movie that's how the movie came together in this sort of zigzaggy way. I think we got the best out of all the talented people by simply trusting them and assuming that if we backed them, they knew what they were doing. And um, he, then what happened was um, Casey Silver was still head of the studio. It had um, His summer was predicated on having a movie which was not a success called Meet Joe Black, and also the sequel to um, the the pig movie, uh, Babe the Pig. Okay, <laughs> neither neither movie was ready, so now he had a hole in the summer his slate, and they promised us an enormous amount of marketing behind the film, and we sort of got seduced by it, which was a terrible mistake because we opened like a week before Armageddon, and we sort of I think the movie grossed like 38 million dollars, and just had we opened in the fall, I think we would have done you know pretty much double that. Nonetheless, the movie holds up, as you can see, enormously well. It's it's done somewhat in the style of a 70s movie because what Soderbergh said was he wanted to do a Hal Ashby movie, um, something like The Last Detail. And even the poster, which is on your poster, is a throwback to sort of 70s poster style. So, and then the, making the movie w was, was, it was a lot of fun. And um, the, the, it was a, something very interesting happened, which is the scene that really starts the story where they meet in the trunk Stephen wanted to shoot it in one take, okay? Now, they're in a trunk, so it's a very <laughs> limited thing. Um, and and he was adamant that he wouldn't do it with any coverage. And because if we had to go back and reshoot it, it was the cheapest, easiest possible scene to shoot, reshoot, okay, to redo. So you support the director, and we said yes. And when we previewed it, I think, in San Mateo, south of San Francisco, the movie did okay, and that movie was one of the, that scene was one of the least like scenes in in the movie. We then reshot it with coverage, you know, their close ups and, and and medium shots. Tested it again, the scores went up, and that scene went to be one of the favorite scenes in the movie. So it was a question of a producer: is do you insist on the director doing it a different way? Well, if we were blowing a lot of stuff up and it would have been millions of dollars to right. come back, we would have done it. But for that, you support the director, and, and, and it kind of worked out. And, and Entertainment Weekly a few years ago voted this the, the sexiest American film of all time. <laughs> and it was also yeah. Stephen's device to do that sort of flash forward, um, you know, when the, then the lovemaking, which has since been copied many times. So it, it was a throwback to a 70s movie. It helped their careers. And it's just... It's one of the films that when I meet with writers, if you're working in that genre or something that's adjacent to that genre, everyone will sort of reference it. And then the, the other thread to pick up on is is Elmore Leonard, who, who Elmore Leonard would and we've done we've done four things of Dutch's. We've done uh, Get Shorty, that we did a sequel, uh, Be Cool. We did this Be Cool sequel. I'm sorry, we did Get Shorty, the sequel Be Cool, um, Out of Sight. And we did a TV show called Karen Cisco and. The trick to him is he would set he would create characters and set them in motion so that maybe a supporting character would actually take over his imagination and become a major character. So his storytelling had a wonderful unpredictability to it, but it also had movie elements. But if you try to just shoehorn it into the movie elements and do it a straightforward story, it loses its charm. 
And because this is sort of more of a meandering style, but you know, uh, Chili Palmer <coughs> comes to Los Angeles to collect a debt, ends up as a movie producer. And Scott <laughs> Frank created the device of Chili Palmer, uh, uh, you know, falling in love with movies. In Out of Sight, Out of Sight, Out of Mind, the expression, you, c you, can't, you can in a book have one character thinking about another character and therefore that character is alive in the book but in a movie you can't do that so there are scenes in out of sight that weren't in the book there's that wonderful fantasy sequence where she's in the bath uh there's um the waving in the elevator there's the phone call where clooney calls and uh dennis farina is in the house and stuff like that just to sort of keep them connected but Dutch, Elmore Leonard, in, in my opinion, is sort of like the patron saint of, of Cable because in Cable you have like effectively an ADR movie and you can take all these detours and zigzags and characters pop up in Cable like in um, Breaking Bad, the, um, Aaron Paul's character I don't think was slated to be a major character but obviously he ended up as the second most important character in the series. And, and Justified, of course, is a, is, a, is a tribute to how great his storytelling is. So... It's um, that kind of surprise, bordering on more of a classic storytelling as opposed to an artificial surprise that basically is just cheesy storytelling. It's it's a some of the uh, the best movies I've been lucky enough to be involved in were always kind of commercial with elements that seem familiar but done in a fresh way, and for the most part aren't execution proof. In other words, you can. You can do certain blow em up movies and they don't have to be great, like, you know, the new Jurassic Park, which is really a fun ride, but it's not a great movie, whereas Spielberg's original Jurassic Park, I consider one of the great, great movies. So these movies have to be really well done. Well, and I feel like without a sight, you know, one thing that's really terrific in watching is the, the style serves the content. Yeah. So even like the freeze frames, which is a, you know, that, that a, a was device. That Soderbergh device. Right. Yeah. And, but it goes perfectly with the timeout, yeah. which is like an ongoing theme of the film. Yeah. You know, so I feel like these choices made, they were very much driven by an aesthetic. They weren't just Yeah, and there's a certain randomness to where he does it. It's almost like there's not that much logic to it. But And also, we had this really cool score, by, this electronic score by David Holmes. His first movie he'd done, he went on to do more movies with Steven. So... It just, uh, yeah, it had the right kind of vibe to it. So I'm asking because of somebody who also worked in the system at the studio. Yeah. Um, I know that it's very hard to get the studio people to kind of approve the randomness, you know, is they don't like that, you know, and so it's like, how do you deal with that? Because as we know, a producer is between the talent and the studio. And what impresses me about you is that you keep working with the same people. I mean, I just saw you in Toronto and yeah. the, there was a party with a Sandra Bullock movie, and there was George Clooney, yeah. and everybody wants to talk to George Clooney, and George Clooney is in the corner talking to him for half an hour. Everybody wanted to kill him. He took George Clooney away. <laughs> so the question is, how do you navigate between you know, the talent who says, I want this, screw the studio, blah, blah, blah. And the studio says, you tell him, blah, blah, blah. Well, you have to, you, first of all, you have to be, the way I've always worked is you have to be loyal to the director because executives come and go, but directors are your stock and trade. And the only way to make a movie, and remember this, is if everybody's working from a shared point of view. Don't hire a director who disagrees with your point of view. Don't hire a screenwriter who disagrees with your point of view. So if the screenwriter agrees and you get a screenplay you both like, and then the director agrees, you're all defending and fighting for the same point of view. And the notes you give are all in support of moving the same vision forward. So you're all sort of a team, you know, bonded by this shared creative vision. And then, you know, you just, you, you, studio executives are very good at, at understanding where there's a problem and not so good at solving the problem. The, the, there's a case in point at the end of Aaron Brockovich, um, which had the most phenomenal scores, second best scores I've ever had in a test audience, okay? But the, st the studio felt that it needed a little bit more at the end, and the suggestion was, well, let's have a courtroom scene where they win in the courtroom and everybody cheers, which is like so cliche. 
And, and, and Soderbergh figured out that what people really wanted was to see Aaron Brockovich and, and uh, Ed Masry, Albert Finney, and, and Julia together again. So the scene at the end of the film of Aaron Brockovich, of those of you who've seen it, where uh, uh, Albert gives her the check and she starts going off on him, this check, you're going to screw me, this check isn't enough, and then the check is so much, she's speechless for once, okay? That, that was additional photography just to satisfy that note. So, you know, I think you treat studio executives with respect. Their careers are on the line, their money's on the line. Um, I've never been in a situation, frankly, where studio executives were, were brutal. We've disagreed, but always in sort of a polite way. And you kind of maneuver around them. And sometimes, you know, they are right. And sometimes the directors don't see it until the audience tells them. And you, you can see that this needs to be changed. They can't see it, so you let the audience tell them. So the principle of navigation is to really have a shared point of view with the people with whom you're making the film. And everybody can sort of, you know, go to bat for that. What well, was it difficult with this, like you had mentioned, you know, Steven Soderbergh had done, like, The Underneath, which didn't really catch on, but, you know, he did this wonderful indie film, King of the Hill. Right, Which, yeah. uh, you know, he did that after Sex, Lies, and Videotape, and so he had a, a great artistic track record, but not a commercial one. For yourself, then, as, as a producer, what... Was it difficult to get the studio to say, well, okay, here's a lot of money? To no, put it, it was an Casey indie Silver who gave the script to Steven Soderbergh okay. because he had released King of the Hill and, and they, they were friends. In fact, this thing that Soderbergh's doing now for HBO called Mosaic, I think Casey is producing. So that, that wasn't hard at all. And so they were behind you with also well, yeah, with George that, Clooney that, and that, Jennifer that was Lopez. a period where those types of movies could be made. Yeah. Well, what's happened is when I started out, I've been in the film business for 35 years, and um, when I started out, the box office was 84% domestic and 16% foreign. It's now 72% foreign and 28% domestic. So the movies that travel to the foreign market, it's, there's a lot of special effects, a lot of stuff blows up, there are cartoon characters, this and that. You know, um, That's the kind of movies the studios want to fully finance. They don't want to fully finance movies like this anymore. But however, you, through foreign pre-sales or equity investors, you can still get them made. There are a lot more steps to get them made, and the studio have excess capacity in their distribution pipelines. They, they can't release a, a comic book movie every month, okay? They just don't have enough of them, and the, and the audience doesn't want them. So you can still get these movies made, but you sort of have to piece together the financing. If you look at Black Mass, Black Mass has, a, you know, if you look at the, generally on a more independent film, the, the, which has a, a, like t you know two football teams worth of producers. Everybody either wrote a check or owned the property or managed somebody. It's almost like it's almost like junk DNA. You you know some 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 gene that was valuable at some point put the movie together. So uh, the point is you can still get a lot of these movies made. The studios aren't writing the checks for them like they used to, and even more now you sort of have to have, to have some creative vision behind them. You have, um, so for example, you have a movie, Burnt, coming up yeah. with Bradley Cooper. Did the studio finance this? Yeah. Because Bradley is the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the cat's meow. I mean, this, the, the, it's a longer story, okay? <laughs> But no, uh, yeah, the studio, uh, they fully, it originally it was developed at Paramount and then Harvey picked it up and put Bradley in it. And Free Held with Juliana Moore. And yeah, Free Held, which is out now, was this wonderful movie about gay rights. It's a documentary I saw about seven years ago, five or six years ago, when in order to vote for the best documentary short, you used to, used to have to go to the Academy and watch all the movies. So they vouch that you'd watch them now. They send them out on DVD. And I saw it, it made me cry. And I told my partner, Stacy, we optioned it. And then Ron Nicewinter wrote Philadelphia, wrote this great script, and we attached Ellen Page. And then it took us about five years to get Julie. But and, and the movie's not I, I, the movie's done really poorly. The reviews were not good to it. But the funny thing is, I, I was saying, which is if you aim high and miss, you can still hold your head up. And I'm really proud of the movie. And emotionally, I feel like I made a movie that I'm proud of. So if I'd simply made a a, 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 a chase movie or, or some sort of yeah. movie like that, and it failed, I'd feel feel bad. But I, I like the movie. So that one took a long time. Let going. me ask you something. For somebody who has so many 
credit, such a long list of credit. You have the shortest Wikipedia page <laughs> on the internet. Well, I think I wrote I was it. trying to find <laughs> how you started, what you did. Oh. It was like this short. So oh, that, I think that's people, part if you have short list of credit, you have a big book. <laughs> Wikipedia page. It's by design. I, I think. I think I had one of my assistants write it. So <laughs> <laughs> to keep it mysterious and whatnot. Well, I'll tell. I'll tell you very quickly the, the genesis of my career. Okay. Um, I I graduated from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I I graduated in English because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Now, when kids go to college, the default major is media studies, okay? If you don't know what you want to do, you go into media studies. And um, I was very fortunate <laughs> that my oldest friend who died a year ago, uh, who I met on the first day of college, was Harold Ramis, who's, as we know, a great comedy genius. And I went off and became a newspaper reporter. I worked for Time Magazine. I then met some people who were doing experimental video documentary, video work, and I started a company that did experimental documentaries. Um, for, for public television. I got a little tired of that and I wanted to get into the movie business. I'd moved to Los Angeles, but I didn't know anybody. And I didn't know anybody in the studio system. And, um, but I had, I was driving through North Beach in San Francisco and I just had this kind of blink moment where I said, I'll do a movie about the beat generation. And um, I, I, I found a book called Heartbeat. It was written by Carolyn Cassidy, who was married to Neil Cassidy. And Neil Cassidy is is Dean Moriarty and On the Road, and Jack Kerouac's very good friend. And they sort of had a menage a trois. And I had enough sense to know that that period in American culture and literature would be of appeal to talent. At that time. Yeah, through, through because <laughs> they've since made On the Road. And... Um, through a friend in my documentary company, I met a guy who had forty thousand dollars from his family to get into the film business, and we hired a writer director named John Byram, who was very hot at the time, and he would only do the script for forty thousand if he could also direct it. He directed one small movie, and he wasn't a particularly great director, but this guy really knew how to get a movie going. And um, the story was this: he knew Diane Keaton's sister. <laughs> and he got the script to Diane Keaton, who wanted to do it. And it was the same year that Annie Hall came out, and Orion Pictures, a company that's since gone out of business, figured if she wins the Oscar for Annie Hall, which was their movie, they wanted her next movie, okay? So they started to help us, and they got Nick Nolte to be in it, because they had done uh, Who'll Stop the Rain. And so now we had Nick. And then Diane Keaton fell out, and then we ended up with Sissy Spacek. And the movie, which nobody saw, is called Heartbeat with Nick Nolte and Sissy Spacek. Through that, at the same time, because of my friendship with Harold Ramis, who'd written Animal House, the studios wanted to get into the comedy business um, off of the, su the success of SNL, figuring that's where the audience is. So with my partner from the movie Heartbeat and another guy named Doug Kenny, who had written um, Animal House, who, who just since died, we started a company... We did a, a movie called Modern Problems with Chevy Chase that was actually commercially successful, and it was sort of okay. But we had an office on the Fox lot, and across the hall was Lawrence Kasdan, who was writing The Big Chill. We became friends, and he asked me to produce The Big Chill. And because I produced The Big Chill, um, my ex-wife's sister, that is my ex-sister-in-law, <laughs> was the roommate of John Cleese's fiance. Uh, <laughs> Welcome I, to Hollywood, by the way, right here. It's all about siblings. <laughs> and I met John Cousins. Cleese, and he asked me to produce Fish Called Wanda because he wanted Kevin Klein and he wanted an American producer. So my career is what I call good taste and good luck, okay? <laughs> I kind of know who the good people are, and I ingratiate myself to them. I mean, the way Pulp Fiction came about is Danny DeBito and I were partners, and we hired Stacey Sher as a great producer to be our development executive. And she came in one day right after she started, well, you got to read this script. And I sat down at lunch and in 40 minutes read Reservoir Dogs. And I said to Stacy, let's just get this guy. Whatever he's going to do next, let's do it. <laughs> and Danny had enough clout at the studio, so we made a deal with Quentin and his partner, Lawrence Bender, for Pulp Fiction before he'd even shot Reservoir Dogs. Wow. And, and, um, so, you know, it was just sort of a nose for the kind of people you wanted to work with. And, um, you know, also first-time directors and new directors are sort of fun. And you're sort of looking for people who are sort of against the mold but want to be in the Hollywood system. When it seems like you pick projects that 
you know, in your discussion here, it's about things that excite you and yeah. not so much about, like, Pulp Fiction, I, I can't imagine you would have predicted, like, that thing could have made no, anywhere uh, near the money uh, it did. two funny stories. First, when Quentin, I, I remember saying to Quentin, uh, Quentin, this is the Lawrence of Arabia of whatever it is. <laughs> okay, and then Quentin came into my office after his success. And he, he, when he started out, he said, "I've studied careers. When you're a director, your first film gets your second film. Your second film establishes your career. And I'm going to do Pulp Fiction, and we're going to do as much business as Mo Money. Mo Money was a Wayans yeah, Brothers yeah, film yeah, that so. did about thirty-five million dollars, and of course, it, Pulp Fiction did a hundred. $8 million domestic. And then after that, Quentin came in and said, you know, I've just been offered the Green Hornet from Universal. If if Pulp had done more money business, I'd be doing it. Now I can do whatever I want. Right. So, you, so I think the lesson there is very successful people don't just study films, which you must study films, but they also study careers. And I read a lot of business histories of Hollywood. And for you, the big break was... Yeah, uh, big chill and yeah, and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the big. How did you and Danny around. DeVito become partners? You know, I I'd made a producing deal at TriStar Pictures, and unbeknownst to me, he was negotiating to set up a company, and I I went to him through his agent with the project. We became friends. Then they asked me to partner, and then Stacy was the first person we hired, and we had a we had a really good run of it. You know, and then Stacy became a partner. Yeah, that right away. I mean, after about a year, we made Stacy well, a partner. Well, when you and Danny DeVito and Stacy came together as a company. It's like it was like one movie, iconic movie. Yeah, after yeah we were talking another. about this. It's like unbelievable. Like you so couldn't miss for like what, 10 years there. What was the role that each one of those partners brought, brought to the partnership? And I'm asking that because, you know, students sometimes want to go and get the next big thing. And sometimes I say, you know, it's the energy around you and the people around you. And well, no, so that's, a, that's a good observation. Uh, you know, look, Danny, Danny was directing then. He loved films. He knew a lot of films. He loved filmmakers. And he had a cloud as a big star. So you could yes. get him in a room as somebody who wanted to do fresh, original stuff. Yes. Stacy had grown up on a lot of good films. So we just were sort of not going so much against the grain, but looking to just take chances within the studio system. And we had the resources from the studio, we had Danny's political clout, and we had our own taste and ability. It was just a combination. But the, the larger thing there is for everybody coming into the system, you know, if, if you look at, you know, Scorsese making all the movies with De Niro, you know, people come up together as a group. And, and, and the chances of you hitting the bullseye with, coming up with a script for, say, Spielberg or Michael Bay or whoever that's sort of <laughs> like the movies, that, sort of like big movies they do anyway, yeah. the, you do better with a fresh script that gets an established director's eye. And what you really do better is is to find the next guy, you know, to find Damien Chazelle who directed Whiplash, yes. you know, or, or any one of these guys who are kind of your age and then be, befriend them. So people come up as generations in Hollywood. Totally. I just saw, did you see uh, Son of Soul? No, I, so, I, I hear it's good. I haven't seen oh it. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yes. Well, Young guys. Yeah. And, and also, too, I feel like you, you find movies and filmmakers that are really of the time. Like uh, Reality Bites, was was that a Jersey film production? Yeah, that was actually, because I'd done The Big Chill, I'd met Helen Childress, the screenwriter. She was a young writer. The agency sends a writing sample. But then I started talking to her about her and her friends, and the stories were great. I said, look, I've done the big chill. Why don't you do the big chill for your generation? And it's funny, the National Geographic Channel is doing a series on Generation X, and I just did a long interview for them today about how that came about. And that was Ben Stiller's uh, and, yeah, we feature needed, directorial debut. we needed a director, debut. and Ben had done the Ben Stiller show for MTV, which are these wickedly precise parodies of media. And, and and he, you know, we knew we needed somebody who was good with actors mm -hmm. and, and could direct well. And also, the, the hallmark of successful small films is always good performances. And any director who launches his or her career off of a small film is because they were good with actors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, I was at Imagine at the time, and I had to do a movie with Chris Rock, and I said to him, who would you recommend upcoming directors? Yeah. And he said, this guy, Ben Stiller. Yeah. We didn't know who it was, and Tamara <laughs> Davis. Gary Stiller's kid, he, he directs. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyway, and I looked at both film and I offered Ben, and he accepted, and then his, uh, uh, the Ben Stiller show came up. 
and or was it reality? One of those. <laughs> no, yeah. the reality show came up, and reality. Anyway, your movie came up. Shall we open it to gone. these guys? Yes. Let's open up to the students. Good evening, Mr. Schamberg. Hi. Thank you very much for coming. Oh sure. Um, I do have a question. Actually, I have a lot of them, but I, I can ask only one. So I'll use my Start time. Start with one. Properly. Uh, you were mentioning about Jurassic Park, uh, the Steven Spielberg's version and the new one. And um, what really makes the film to be the great film and the well done film? What's the difference? What's yeah. the difference, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question that has, I honestly don't know if I could answer, but it's part, look, the art of directing is you're faced with this constant flow of a thousand decisions. Literally, that shirt, stand there, put the camera there, and through instinct and experience, great directors make those choices right into a certain type of uh, into a certain type of material. But but I think Spielberg, who's obviously a great director, and, and probably in the history of cinema, no one knows where to put the camera better than him. Although I argue Soderbergh's up there because one of Steven's thing is directors should know where to put the camera. The material was fresh, okay, so it is hard to top it, and then he executed it perfectly. Whereas the new Jurassic Park, which I think is a lot of fun, um, it, it just there are just too many contrivances in it. You know, when they, it's like when the guy in the control room has the Jurassic Park T-shirt on, and they go, "Don't talk about what happened to the original Jurassic Park." I'm going. All right, wait a minute. The last one, the dinosaurs started killing people, and now the new one's safe, and all the families are going there. You just have to kind of get over that. You know, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so, I, I maybe it's just maybe it's just because been there, done that. But for a new generation, it's not been there, done that. So, remember, you have kids who are seeing it, the new one, and it's new to them. So, it, it's a great question. I'm not sure I could ever answer it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Hi. Uh, as a new young actor, uh, what, for, especially I think we start with the indie projects because the studios will may not, yeah, uh, yeah. whenever. So when you're dealing with the indie projects and the people and the team, what should you be looking at within the director, the script, and the people uh, to choose the well, right project? Well, you said speaking as an actor? Yep. You know, work gets your work, that's all. You don't know whether you're going to get it on the first one or the fifth one, okay? So just do work that you think you're doing good work in and take every opportunity you can. Now, that's separate from a creative disagreement for the people with whom you're doing the work, but take every opportunity you can get, okay? No job is too small. And then, you know, without being stubborn, overly stubborn, just defend your performance and put the performance on the screen you feel confidence in and... You know, just do it enough times and hope you get discovered. <laughs> Very because, simple. Uh, normally what happens is like maybe uh, two or three people in the team are talented and are delivering. But, uh, you know, the rest of the team doesn't fit into the, you know, talent or the expectations. Yeah. So how do you evaluate that while you're you know, considering <laughs> an independent project? You know, I, I, it, it, I, there's no general principle. It's all kind of situational. And I just think... I, you know, I think you go into it with a vision of what is your best, and you just constantly strive to give your best and, and hope for the best. You know, and, and you know, and we had Joe Montana speak here. Did did you interview him, Typho? Um, he, and Joe Montana is an actor has been working for for decades. And you know, one thing he said was like early on, you can't really make a bad choice, right? I mean, you're, you're trying. Well, you can't. You're trying to improve your reel. You're trying to meet people. You're trying to work. You did you see Viola Davis in this movie? Yeah, the, she's great. What, three minutes <laughs> hard. You, you take the work, and then it's only later on when your career is, you know, hitting that next level where mistakes can be made. But early on, it's all good. And by then, you're gonna have agents and managers, yeah. and so don't and, worry. do no, you'll yeah, be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Just work. <laughs> you know, I, I think I, I think you have to separate your desire to do good work, which I think is sort of your touchstone with building a career and you have to navigate you have to navigate both. I, I always like to say the producer has two jobs. One is to get the movie made and the other is to get it made well and they're not always the same job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, good evening. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, my question is about breaking into the industry as far as how can a young aspiring filmmaker get a meeting with someone like you, someone uh, who's <laughs> way up there and 
You know, that's it's uh, you know, you know my, my joke is Robert Town, the great screenwriter who wrote and won the Oscar for Chinatown. It's like I I heard him speak once, and my joke was that the first question anyone's going to ask was how do I get an agent, which is the last thing you want to ask Robert Town. I honestly <laughs> I honestly don't know. I just think you have to keep doing work now. Here's the thing. I'm conv- you know I'm an advisor to BuzzFeed, okay, and BuzzFeed does. BuzzFeed gets a billion and a half views a month of their videos, short and medium form videos. We're working on some movie ideas. And um, there, there's YouTube. Just make stuff. All you can do is make stuff. There was this film last year. It had a lot of special effects. I can't think of the name of it, but off of it, the director got a deal with J.J. Abrams and I think Spielberg to do a movie at Sony. You know, when I started, people used to go to film school because you got the equipment. And you got the film, and you got people to do it. You know, and I was with Soderbergh once in New York about five or six years ago, and the waiter comes over and says, I'm sorry to bother you, but I've got so much money, what film school should I go? And he said, why don't you just buy a camera? <laughs> so you, you do it, you learn, you do it by doing it. And it's called YouTube, okay? And just make stuff and make stuff and make stuff and get good at your craft. And as you get good at your craft, hope that something goes viral, or at least you have a reel you can show people, and somebody will pick it up. But I couldn't give you a more direct route than that, you know? Thank you very much. One of the um, kids who um, studied here in high school and then went to work with Maker Studio and, you know, yeah, sold I, to Disney for a lot of money. And what he said is uh, his success in making videos and posting on YouTube and so on and so forth is that he, if something is trending, let's say if it's Donald Trump or something, he'll go and quickly yeah, make right. something and, you know, a parody of it or whatever. So this way, he has more chance to be viewed. And once people view that, they say, hey, this guy is funny. Let's see what else he does. It's really a director's medium now. They're desperate for directors. And, you know, they'll take, you know, the guy who did Godzilla, is it Gareth Edwards, is now doing a Star Wars movie. Um, um, Who else? And before that, he did a little movie called Monster, which was great. Yeah, Monster, yeah. Yeah, tiny that, budget. Yeah, yeah. That's that's what they got him off, and they took a chance on yeah. him, and they're just you know, just scrape together some dough and do something that's coherent, and, and somebody will discover you. Mm-hmm. You know, Scorsese's daughter came to our high oh, really? school. What? Oh, I'm so, Oh, yeah. Uh, took the course the high school three times in New York. And uh, he said to me, it's great because they walk into a room and somebody hands them a camera. Yeah. And they make, by the end of the movie, they make a movie. Good or bad, they made a movie. The next week, they make another Look, movie uh, and it's a little better. The Tangerine, yeah. which I haven't seen, was shot on an iPhone. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I know, thank you for Matilda. In oh, the name of you. all the girls around the world. Yeah. Um, I love it. And second, I want to know... What is that that you see in a script that makes you go for it? Like good question. Uh, the, the, you want to know what makes a good script? You want to know what happens next so you turn the page. <laughs> <laughs> and that sounds both obvious and you'd be surprised how many scripts you just don't care. You yes. Know? Sometimes I read writing samples and the, the writing is really good, but there's not enough story momentum or depth of character. So do you want to know what happens next? And, and that could be because the character has a challenge. You just want to see more of the character. The story's so compelling. I mean, they're, they're, that's sort of a catch-all, but that's it, you know. And, 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 you know, read screenplays of your favorite movies to see the quality of the writing. You know, I, I like to say screenplays aren't the highest form of literature, but they're the hardest because you have to write with such economy, and a good screenplay should be about 110 pages, like if, like the... The, the script for the Aaron Sorkin script for the Jobs movie is just, it's amazing. You know, I, I'm not sure how it's going to come together as a movie, but as a, as a literature, it's just great. I, I mean, read screenplays. It, it, you know, look, not, it, nobody thinks they can be a lawyer just by putting up a sign that says they're a lawyer. Nobody thinks they can be a doctor. Everybody <laughs> thinks they can write a screenplay, okay? And it's remarkable to me how um, people don't read screenplays. Are there screenplays of classic movies? or just contemporary screenplays to see the difference between good writing and just so-so right. writing. Hello, Michael. Um, nice shoes, by the way. <laughs> um, obviously, as a being a producer of your status, you've worked with uh, a lot of very um, incredible names, incredible directors. Um, what um, what do you look for in a director? What kind of factors do you look for? You know, point, point of view, uh, you know, knowledge of... Uh, 
the vision that they have of the film, and then you have to assess their ability to get from their mouth on, on the screen. So point of view is important. What films they reference is important. You know, what camera style they bring to a film, how they see the actors. It's, you know, anything, if you tick all the boxes of what makes a good film, you know, it's well shot, it's well acted, the stories, this and that. You want a director who sort of, in your opinion, agrees with and sees all that. And then, then you know, then it's just, it's, it's just the movie gods, you know. I mean, great directors make bad movies and mediocre directors make good movies, and you know. Um, either, they, I mean, there's people directing cable that are as good as people directing uh, features right now. I mean, there's episodes of Game of Thrones that are just really well directed. But I urge you to watch the Nick Soderbergh show because he shoots it, directs it, and edits it, and he's got a limited time to do it, so every shot counts. So his camera work is amazing. It's just amazing. There's nothing. It's next level stuff on TV. What happens? You said there are two jobs, and obviously we know one is to get the movie yeah. made and one making good one. And how many times as producer we come into a thing where a director comes in. It's the kind of director that can get you movie made, yeah. but he talks. He wants to change the script entirely. He, you know, it's not exactly what you were thinking. And well, then comes I, I, the I, I, either you agree with the changes and you sign on, or you don't. You you move on. That's all. <laughs> you don't lose sleep over that. Yeah. <laughs> There's enough to lose sleep over, I guess, right? It is. <laughs> when you're in a, that situation, it's. Yeah, because if you start selling out for somebody's vision, you don't agree just on the hope that that director is going to get the movie made. It might not happen anyway, and then you've sort of lost a year. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you for the speech. Um, I'm a director, producer here, so I have a question about budget. Like, how do you make the, the decision about your budget? Like, for example, you can raise two million, but when you make the budget, you realize maybe you need two and a half. Will you cut the budget into two, or you want to raise more money? You know, I, 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 my see on our movie Freehold because we kept having to cut for budget. We cut the script and it made the script together. I take the two million and figure out how to make it. Okay, if somebody said here's two million, you can make the movie now, but you need two and a half, but you don't know where the other half is. Figure out how to take the two million and make the movie just move forward. You know. Uh, just, just take the money and. But go. he, but he just said, <laughs> like you have two jobs. One is make the movie, yeah. and second is make a good movie. Yeah. So the second one. But but I, I don't know. I I can solve a lot of problems, where you think you need more money and you don't. You know, one of the mysteries of films is that scripts, you think you've taken all the emotional redundancy out of a script and you shoot it and then you go to a preview and you realize a scene, you're actually say, having the same scene in a different setting and the audience says you don't need that scene. I just think you have to be very rigorous with, you know, do you need... You know, do you need 200 extras? Can you get by 100 extras? Can you combine locations? You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of sort of below the line decisions you can make to to save money and, and have more time to shoot the film. I just think you figure out how to do it. You know. Thank you. Thank you, you so particularly much. Particularly if that's your one opportunity, you just got to <laughs> go for it. You know, I mean, <laughs> sure. Don't wait for the miracle. Hi. Hi. As a young writer, fresh out of grad school, what is your advice on the first step to take? Uh, well, write every day because <laughs> the people who are really good at writing, it just sort of comes to them naturally. Uh, so you just need to be disciplined and write every day. That's the first thing, just to sort of build your craft. Obviously, study other people's scripts and just keep writing. Um, y you know, you sort of have to pick if you're going to be discovered. You can pick something that's 100% execution dependent because it's a very personal story and that movie, if, if that script if it's good will get made but if it's a very narrow target as opposed to picking a wider target you can do with some integrity I think you sort of have to game out what you're writing about but all, the only advice I can really give you is just wake up and say whether you write it morning or at night just say I'm going to write for X hours a day and do it, do it, do it. Some days will be hard, some days will be easy, but you just kind of get that muscle going. Sorry, I guess maybe I didn't rephrase the question. I meant in the sense of getting a job with the writer. I'm sorry? I meant in the sense of getting a job with you know, the scripts you've already written. Oh, you mean getting the movie made? Yeah. Um, but as a writer, trying to work as a writer in Hollywood. 
You know, I, I, it's hard for me to know because I didn't come up as a writer, but you know, I've met a lot of people lately because I have a TV company who literally started out as assistants to TV producers and they were in the writer's room and then they just became writers, okay? So get, so if you want to be a writer, find any job you can that's as close to what you want to do and just be good at the job. Either you'll be good at the job because people ask your advice or you'll be good at the job and people just want to promote you. So that's the best I, I can do. And then keep writing and show your stuff to people, you know? It's just, just try everything. I, I really can't be more specific than that. Thank you very just much. Just remember that a lot of people just read the first 30 pages, and if it's not good, they don't continue. Yeah. <laughs> or the first 10 Don't pages. wait them to discover it at page 80, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, what an amazing career. Oh, thank you. What great movies you've worked on. Uh, my question is, when you read Quentin, Tarantin Quentin Tarantino's yeah. uh, Reservoir Dogs and then uh, Pulp Fiction, what was it? that you fell for? You know, he, he's sort of in a class by himself. Um, yeah. His dialogue, well, first of all, right. dialogue, he's a throwback to the days of great dialogue movies, okay? So everybody knows his dialogue's very idiosyncratic, and you've read his screenplays. He sort of, he writes in his stage direction that's almost like a novella, and he speaks to the reader. So it's just his voice, but m more than anything, his dialogue. He just, guy just has an amazing ear for dialogue. Aaron Sorkin has an amazing ear for dialogue. They're just right. people who can write dialogue, you know, like, um, uh, you know, like Billy Wilder could before he became a director, or um, even in this movie, the dialogue is yeah, Scott yeah that's Scott on. Prank and, and Elmore Leonard and or Patty Chayefsky. They're just people who can write dialogue, and 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 play, playwrights tend to have to some degree a good leg up because they have a good ear. So so I think I think more than anything it was Quentin's dialogue, you know. Okay, I'm just gonna work on that then. <laughs> yes, thank exactly. you. Also, he has such audacity in his thing, you know. Yeah, and remember, just... Quentin didn't go, he didn't finish high school, but he worked in a video store for years and years <laughs> and watched everything. So, if I have one thing to say, you must study old movies, okay? When I meet with a writer or a director or an actor, everyone will have grown up on some movie. And that's a shared vocabulary. Somebody like this romantic comedy, somebody like that action movie. If I've seen it, we all of a sudden have a shared vocabulary. And, and you know, it's like if you want a degree in literature, you would be reading Shakespeare. You'd be reading this one and that one. So if you're not, if you're not familiarizing yourself with classic cinema, you will never be successful. You just won't. So it means don't complain about film art or genre or great screenplays <laughs> classes, all right? None of us. You don't get to. He said he proved it. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Um, so I can imagine it being uh, extremely nerve wracking sitting in a pitch meeting and asking people for millions of their dollars. <laughs> um, so uh, what exactly did you do to become comfortable with that? Or does that, is that something that still kind of freaks you out? You know, it's sort of the, 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 the I feel it's my job as a producer to sort of create the vision of it. OK. And to come in with a confidence and, and, and say, this is going to work. I've been right and I've been wrong. But I've always believed in it, okay? I've always believed in the best vision of what I was selling in order to sell it with a real sort of integrity and kind of centeredness to it. So I just think you need a belief in the material and then you need a bit of showmanship. What you can't do is kind of mumble and not be heard and stuff. People, you, you, I believe you can convey information from the point of view of the person receiving it. This is something I tell my assistants, don't assume people understand your shorthand, you know, uh, so you have to you have to play to your audience. You have to be a showman, a salesman, an actor to sell something, and you all and you have to hold to that. There are days when people will lose confidence in it, and you just have to be the one who's confident. So you need a measure of self confidence, and it's in it's, it's some days, you know, you know, there's two ways. You can actually be self confident, or you. Can, you know, you go the other way, which is if you pr pretend you're self-confident, people think you're self-confident, and then you start to feel self-confident, you know? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, which I think... I think, I think that people also um, can write out the pitch, can try it in front of the mirror to get the confidence and so on. Well, so I course. do. I rehearse in my head. I do the talking points in my head. Uh, and I memorize an outline of it, but I don't over-memorize the pitch just to sort of hit all the bases. But you try and play to the room, you know? When, and it sounds like, you, you know, you talk about these projects that you really care about and you yeah. love. And so I think a lot of that, too, is like you're conveying something that you care about. Yeah, I've sold movies that never should have been made, and they were. <laughs> but. <laughs> 
so <laughs> I guess I'm proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> In your years uh, with Jersey Films, uh, were there projects that came to you that the partners didn't necessarily agree on? No, we all, if one of us wanted to do it, but you could ask me the mistakes I've made. One mistake I made was that we were offered to produce uh, Austin Powers and turn it down. Now we it met with Mike Myers, but the reason was he wanted to direct and we didn't have confidence in him as a director and it wasn't our style to move him off of directing, but had we been smart enough to just go down the road till somebody said he could direct, we would have made Austin Powers. So that's something I passed on that was stupid. Um, no one's ever heard of Austin Powers. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it's cool. I, there's a few other things like that, but but as partners, we never do. If one of us wanted to do it, the other one would support him. That that's what you do in a partnership. Every, and then when Stacy Sher and I were partners, it's the same thing. If she wanted to run with something, I'd support her, and vice versa. You speak so respectfully uh, about directors. Have you ever wanted to direct? No, my wife thinks I should direct, but I, I'm in too much respect for people who are really good at it, okay? <laughs> um, my, my biggest fear is I wouldn't be good with the actors. I'm not so. It's, it's with a certain awe of people who are great at it that I don't think I could measure up to that. That's why I've never wanted to direct. It's, it takes a lot of time, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I know we're wrapping sure. up here. Um, one question I wanted to ask is, you know, if your whole uh, credits, you know, which is 50 plus features that have been released and plus TV, which one do you feel is like almost like the biggest miracle that it came together as it did? <sighs> I don't know that the miracle is quite the word, but but when I was first starting out, it, it, when we had the script of the Big Chill, remember Kazan had done Body Heat. He'd written Raiders, he's written Empire, the Star, yeah. Star Wars movies, okay. And I understood that movie was going to be great, and nobody wanted to make it, okay. And, um, and interestingly enough, the studio executives who were of the same age as the characters in it wouldn't fight for it, and nobody thought it was funny, okay. That's Ooh. the crazy thing about it. And I knew it that, and it sucked all the oxygen out of my day. And I walk up every day and going, I've got to get this movie made. If I don't get this movie made, I don't know what I'm going to do. And we just pushed and pushed and got it made. So Did Marsha Nassiter? Yes, yeah, so it was Marsha Nassiter, who was then running Johnny Carson's company, a wonderful uh, producer who stood up and made it. So there, there have been movies that I just, th that was a turning point in my career because it was the first, it was right. nominated, I was nominated for an Oscar. And it was the first kind of commercial and, and creative success I'd really had. So, so there's some points where you just want to get the movie made, and that 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 was critical at that point. In and, and an unlikely commercial product too. I mean, it's a group of friends get together after. If you haven't seen it, one of one of the friends commits suicide. Yeah, and Kevin Costner. Yeah, yeah, Kevin Costner as the body. The body. And uh, yeah, and it's like they get together. And I don't think it was an unlikely success. I, I think my feeling is when an actor or a director is at the top of their game. Their instincts about what the audience want are better than yeah. what the studio's instincts are about what the audience want. And that, that pertains, they choose their material well. And it was just, it, it was of its time, but of its time was ahead of its time for a lot of people running the studio system. And it's just one of those movies you sort of had to push and get made. So when you say that you have such respect for people who know how to, directors who know how to yeah. do it well, obviously Steve Soderbergh comes to mind. And yet, um, he proclaims from time to time that he's just going to quit and he can't really do it anymore. No, he and never said he was quitting directing. He always said he was quitting directing film. films because he was tired of the process. And he said right. that again recently, you know, how, how film directing is fear-based. He never said he was stopping directing. He I just see. He just does, didn't want to direct films anymore because of the, 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 the system and this and that. So, so can you please get him out of retirement then from features? Well, he's not in retirement. He just well, did from 10 features. episodes of The Nick, and he's doing this experiment called Mosaic for HBO, yeah. which is multi-point of view storytelling based on an app that he has. So he, he's not going to stop directing, you know. Yeah. He's directed plays and stuff like that. Y you know, it's... it's um, you, it's like nobody ever said to Picasso, when are you going to stop painting, okay? He, but there's this wonderful show at the Modern Museum of Modern Art in New York of Picasso sculptors, you know, I mean, who knew? This is one of the, probably the greatest artists of the 20th century, and you see room after room of these incredibly sculptors. This guy just kept doing it in different forms. I think people want to work in different forms. 
Just to tell you, it has nothing to do with it. I was just yeah. in Paris after Toronto, and I was sitting next to a woman who writes for Paris Match, and her yeah. best friend was the last wife of Picasso. Oh, really? And she was telling me how Picasso, who Ariana Huffington called a monster, was basically uh, capable of doing incredible kind things. And she started telling me at all the people that he helped and yeah. the Jewish thing, it, you know, which was very, very interesting, actually, because she knew him and she knew the wife. Yeah. And she just said, you know, that people just... Well, you, you need to study careers. And one of the things that fascinates me is people who sustain careers over time. Yeah. I was at Zurich at the film festival, and there, were these, there was a film called The Man Who Knew Infinity. It's about an Indian mathematician, and two world-class mathematicians were there. And I didn't get a chance to talk to them. One of them, the guy, the guy looked like he was 12, but he was 30. He won the Field Prize, which is the Nobel Prize of math. And the other guy was a famous guy, too. And he, he was in his 40s. And I started a conversation about, well, how do you keep your creativity going? How do you, as a mathematician, wake up? Where do your ideas come from? And then how do you challenge yourself? It's not a conversation I was able to finish, but will. But I, I'm interested in how people keep reinventing themselves creatively, which Soderbergh is really good at okay yeah um Clint, look at clint eastwood you know his movies get better and better and better and for every off movie he'll make two great movies or you know for woody allen for every good movie there's two off movies but he's got the reverse <laughs> form <laughs> woody allen, woody. But, but they keep working what yeah. else are they going to do you know it's like i said nobody said to picasso were you going to stop painting today and somehow people in this art form they feel they should just sort of retire and i'm also fascinated by people who were at the top of their game you know, say like a John Badham or somebody like that, and I, I don't know what they're doing anymore, you know. Or Walter Hill, who was really a good director. Is, is, is it the style changes? They don't change. Or, or, or like Altman, who kept directing. And, and, and I read a quote once, I never met him, where he said, well, you know, I just, I do my movies cheaply, so it's not that hard to get them made. And he just keeps making them. And this guy was still turning out great movies. And by the way, when I was, uh, my first job was a Warner Brothers executive, and I saw exactly what Clint Eastwood was doing. Yeah. He said, one for them, <laughs> one yeah, for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, so but, but, that's what he yeah. did. He he wanted to try something new, and the studio let him because they knew he's going to make another Dirty Harry for four million dollars. Yeah, and, and there's only that's upside. That's what Scorsese does that. And but you know, I mean, I mean, George told me at that party you're at that he just wants to direct now. He doesn't want to act anymore. He's just as much more interested in producing and directing. You know, it's more challenging to him. I also heard that he was like selling the house in Lake Coma. Um, I, yeah, I, I read that in the gossip. I read that in the gossip column. I heard him say it to two young oh, he said things. That? He, he said, "Yeah, oh. we're done with the house." Okay, but, but he didn't so find that, a script so. for him to act in and, and yeah. get Steven Soderbergh. He said he was features. leaking to the press that they might sell the house, and there was a big outcry in Italy that yeah. now tourists are not going to come. So they have to. I think. Yeah, I think. I, I think it's uh, more of a privacy thing. But yeah, he, we, we talked. Yeah. He didn't so tell me about any of here, that. Actually. So you hear it here. <laughs> I was there pretending to eat, but I listened to everything he had to say. But uh, and he's truly he, as good a guy as he seems. He is. It so is, Michael, let me ask you something. Um, if you would think about one quality that you possess that you think contributed the most to your success as a producer? It's perseverance. You know, it's <laughs> like, if somebody says no, you just go, what do I do? You've already figured out if they there no, what you do. You just don't take no for an answer, okay? It's just, you just have to continually, whether you believe in yourself or not, just keep going, okay? Some days are harder than others because you get a little beaten down by rejection. Some days stuff go your way, but you just have to keep you just have to keep moving forward. It's really in any facet of this business, if you don't have that muscle for perseverance, you're just not you're just not gonna make it. And and don't give up. You know, everybody needs a day job. So if your day job is a sound editor or assistant in this and that, but you want to direct or you want to write, you better find time to do that. You know, like Kazan worked in advertising for seven years in Detroit before he sold a screenplay. He wrote Who? for seven years, Larry Kazan. Right. He sold a screenplay called Continental Divide, which is a romantic comedy. That writing sample came to George Lucas's attention, who asked him to write Raiders, and the Raiders, in my opinion, is one of the greatest screenplays of all time. It's just, it is on the page, everything that's in that movie. Right. 
So you yourself, I mean, I marvel of the fact that half the producers basically give up, you know, 55, six, you know, and you are actually coming up, what, you had like two or three movies this it's year? A and now this you year, and I'm doing this stuff with BuzzFeed, which is really exciting because it's, it's a chance to go at every step of the process and try and innovate, try and do short-form videos that can turn into long-form, uh, you know, <clears throat> I'll try and work off of the characters, the universes that they've created, try and market stuff differently. I think there's two ways you can look at it, okay? Because I've come up with a lot of people, too. You can go, oh, the business is harder, but I, I refuse to say that because my feeling is it's the producer's job to solve the problem, and the first problem you have to solve is how to get the movie made. I, I just liken it to there's more steps, whereas you used to be able to go to the head of the studio who'd write a check, now there's probably, maybe the ratio is every step, there's 10 steps you have to take. <laughs> you have to get more people on the phone, this and that. But you just you just keep going, you know. And, and, and probably in my early days, I was counting on one project at a time. Now I just have enough stuff going on. So if one thing's going up, another thing is going down, you can still, you can still press ahead. But you just have to be really persevering. You may get your lucky break when you're young. You may get it when you're old. But just kind of keep going. And what do you make of it? What is example? Universal just invested two hundred million yeah. at BuzzFeed. Uh, uh, you know, Disney bought makers. What do you think? Other than the fact that they're thinking, oh my God, we have to be with the young generation. Blah blah blah. We have to be cool, like buying MySpace or at one time. What do you think is the real? Vision and the benefit of those kind well, of... Well, I'm lucky enough to work with the guys who started and run BuzzFeed. Zay Frank runs BuzzFeed Motion Picture and Jonah Pratt, who started BuzzFeed. And its process, um, NBC partly wants BuzzFeed for television because they want to have cheaper television that's entertaining across all their different platforms. The movie stuff we're doing, I can't talk about right now, but... But when you say cheaper television, I mean, they're just basically doing internet stuff now. They're not doing cable or... But they will. They could take the same characters and the same... There are themes that are on BuzzFeed. For example, about 60% of the audience is female, and they do a lot of stuff that is emotional, emotional moments in, in people's lives. And you can turn that into classic forms of television and classic forms of film. The thing is this, the legacy studio system here is wedded to a certain type of cost structure and a certain type of process. The, the example I would give is this, there's no R&D model in, in, in movies. The, nobody makes a, a piece of a movie to see if they're gonna make a longer movie, although that's how, um, that's how Whiplash was made. Right. The guy won Buzz, he yeah. won uh, if Sundance with a short one of the film, but nobody's doing that. In television, there's a pilot system. The pilots are enormously expensive. The attrition rate is very high, so hundreds of millions of dollars are being wasted. So you look at BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed's doing short and medium form videos, and they're creating these character universes. What if you could take characters that BuzzFeed knows, have a big audience, put them together, and find a storyline? And these are videos that are being done for $500 each. And then what if in the process of developing a screenplay, the writer could go off and write a three-minute piece, and you could cast with actors, and you could put online and see what the response is. So if you look at every every level of the process chain of developing IP, starting with a whole bed of IP because you're doing original programming with original characters so you don't have to buy a YA novel, you don't have to remake stuff. Right. Uh, you could actually invent stuff at a low cost. If you had a laboratory for it's inventing stuff, at a low, that's, that's what BuzzFeed is. If you look at BuzzFeed, they've got it, literally have a journalism lab in San Francisco that's a lab model in video, we're gonna do a lab model in film at a very low cost structure, and then you innovate across how you find uh, IP content, and then you innovate about how you experiment with it, you innovate how you market it. There's a lot of stuff that contiguous with the studio system can be done. So when you're, when you're buying these companies, you're, you're looking basically to not so much reinvent the wheel, but to improve across all the steps in the value chain. That's, that's, that's the way you go into it. If you just go into it saying, hey, they've got this, we can turn it into a movie, you get into the same development process of, of nothing happens. 
But if you can iterate at a low cost and find ideas, and, and I, I mean, I have access to the BuzzFeed data, so I can see how many views something is getting and then the share statements as to why people are sharing it. It's a new way of generating content, and the system kind of, a system kind of needs that. So, I mean, Maker's a different model. Maker's an MCN, a multi-channel network, whereas BuzzFeed does all their production in-house, and BuzzFeed, they don't, you don't have to go to BuzzFeed to watch BuzzFeed content. They, they're on Pinterest, they're on YouTube, they're on Snapchat now. The Snapchat Facebook, you get to BuzzFeed. Yeah, the Snapchat stuff click. is different than the Facebook stuff, yeah. it's different than the YouTube stuff, and they're just sort of agnostic to whatever platform it is. Um, so what we're used to is that the mechanics of media are kind of set in stone in the, in the legacy media systems, right. but the, the cost of, of the cost of production and distribution and in some degree promotion digitally is so low that you can experiment. Yeah. Um, the so, way they used to do in Pixar, actually, before they even yeah, got to yeah. do the movie, right, right, right. they did small little pieces, and when they liked the character and stuff. So, that so, is fascinating. so the system, you know, if you look at the slate that they've announced at Sony, it's like. They announced Bad Boys 4 and 5. Like, <laughs> There's a lot more story there, though. Yeah, Are they yeah. still bad? Yeah. <laughs> Are they still boys? Yeah, exactly. They announced the remake of Jumanji, which isn't screaming to be remade, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so they, they, it's very, the studios only want IP that comes from another form. They don't have a, and I said to the head of production at Sony about a year ago, I just said, why don't you take $10 million, you're going to lose it anyway on something, and give it to 40, <laughs> give a quarter of a million dollars to 40 screeners and say invent a franchise. If you got one, okay, right. you'd be good. And they just can't grasp it. And, and change, you know, the studio system changes, changes slowly. Also, the business is really good. China is growing. Um, so they just need, they just, in order to keep your job, you need something that makes a half a billion dollars from a franchise. So there's not a lot of incentive to experiment. And the system is always, the movie system has always been sort of in, you know, reinvigorated people from the outside. You know, you, you get Chris Nolan off of Memento and yeah. you give him, for, well, first they gave him Insomnia, then you give him Batman, you know. Right. And, and now they've got Gareth Edwards and um, all these guys. So. Yeah. The system, the system needs new process, and that's that's what's exciting to me is new process. And thanks to digital, you can have new process. Well, can we plug your your new projects? You got Freeheld in theaters now. Freeheld, which which is really good. Please see it. Juliana We've got Burn Moore. coming out, and then I've got a really cool uh, series on AMC called Into the Badlands, which is about which is martial arts. It's the coolest stuff you've seen. So set when your, is it set coming? Your DVRs. Mid mid November. In November, yeah. set your DVRs. Yeah, yeah, so uh, these movies, uh, Burnt's coming out in a couple of weeks, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah? yeah. You, you think so? Yeah. <laughs> He's so confused. He's traveling all today. over. <laughs> Guys, I want us to give him an amazing, an amazing big hand. Well, thank you so much. This was fun for me. Thank you so much. Guys.